This seminar is going to be a fundamental course on cosmic gamesmanship. We shall discuss um, first of all the yang and the yin because what we are studying is the way whatever may be called the universal energy plays. And so the fundamental thing is yang and yin, the positive and negative principles, to use the Chinese words. Next we shall discuss relativity. Next we shall discuss uh, group theory, in and out. And finally, we shall discuss identity. Who are you? But in starting, the moment one talks about cosmic gamesmanship, it carries with it the assumption that the physical universe is a game. And that doesn't seem to be taking it sufficiently seriously. Of course, according to Hindu philosophy, the physical universe is an illusion. They use the word maya. But maya has many meanings, and uh, among these meanings, only one is illusion. And the word illusion, of course, always carries a bad connotation to Western ears. We want something that's for real. But it doesn't necessarily carry such a bad connotation to Hindu ears, because the word maya also means magic, creative power, art, and, of all things, measurement, because it comes from the Sanskrit root matra, M-A-T-R, from which, of course, we get meter, matter, and the Latin mater, mother. In other words, uh, the world is looked upon, or can be looked upon, as a perfectly good illusion, because all art, in a way, is a creation of illusion. On a stage, the actor plays, and Hindus think of the world by analogy with drama. The whole thing is a big act, and there is one actor behind the whole thing, which is you. Not you in the sense of your so-called empirical ego, not you as you imagine yourself and as you ordinarily sense yourself to be, but what is really and truly you at a much deeper level. But you see, when we use the word game or play in English, we usually tend to mean that it's something trivial. You see, we divide life very strictly into play and work. Other peoples don't do this. And that's... Uh, one of the shatteringly awful features of our culture, this division of play and work, so that most people are working at tasks which they hate so that they can make enough money to stop doing it and play. Now, this is perfectly ridiculous. Nobody needs to do that. Because what you get with work, done in this way, done heartlessly and without joy, is money. And what can you do with it? Supposing you do earn time to spare and money to spend, what is there to buy with it? The answer is the other fake and joyless products made by other people who hate their work. <laughs> so there is a certain phoniness, a certain lack of essential quality in uh, almost all the work that we perform because the work is done not for the work but for money and play is considered something separate from work. Work is serious. Play is not serious. In fact, uh, we have a strange incapacity to play at all <coughs> because we always, especially in the United States, play with an ulterior motive. That is to say, play is good for you. And we do everything because it's good for us because we judge the physical world with, um, without our senses 
We judge in theory. We believe that the proof of the pudding is not in the eating, but in the chemical analysis. It is often my fate to have to take lunch in college cafeterias. And uh, what must be happening to the intellectual life of the nation as a result of professors, graduate students, and students eating this kind of stuff is, must be catastrophic. Because I go all over the United <coughs> States to various colleges, and everywhere the fare is exactly the same. You get a so-called salad, which is a piece of that wretched icebox lettuce with a dollop of cottage cheese and a wedge of canned pineapple on top of it. And then you get slices of beef that have been tormented for hours in an electronic purgatory, sloshed over, or rather coated is the exact word, with a gravy made of water, library paste, and bouillon cubes. <laughs> <laughs> then there are, very, uh, there are peas, carrots, and corn, which have been sterilized, because that's important, by boiling for hours. And finally, there is a pie, which is a slab of beige goo, <laughs> crusted in reconstituted cardboard, and topped <laughs> with sweetened shaving cream squirted from an aerosol bomb. <laughs> And all this has been analyzed by dietitians and uh, by the whole department of home economics and is found to veritably contain the right amount of calories, proteins, carbohydrates, and vitamins. Now, actually, this is all a result of academic politics because academic politics, you know, is mainly concerned with feuding between departments. And this is the way in which the home economics department has won out by rotting the brains of historians, anthropologists, mathematicians, and physicists with this miserable fare. <laughs> and uh, this goes on all over. Things are judged, you see, because they are good for you. And if we inquire carefully as to what this good for us is, uh, you, you know, you mustn't look into that. It's taboo. Uh, the whole culture would fall apart if we found out what it was because... What is the good that is good for you is always and necessarily something in the future. It never happens and is never going to happen. All that these vitamins and carbohydrates and things can do for you is keep you in a state of reasonable survival and uh, uh, in which you, you never catch up with anything. Because you see, time is strictly an illusion. There is no such thing as time any more than there is such a concrete thing as the equator. The measurement of time, time is a measure of motion, just like lines of latitude and longitude are a measure of the geographic surface of the Earth. And nobody will ever tie up a roll roast with the equator. Uh, there is, however, such a thing as timing, which is quite different from time. Timing is skillful rhythm. And, but you cannot ever attain proper timing if you hurry, if you're in a hurry to get to the future, because the future is never going to arrive. So if you hurry to get to the future, you always get a punishment for it. For example, instant coffee, <laughs> TV dinners, the sort of food they serve on airplanes, or, or beef that is cooked in electronic ovens where you push the switch and, go, and a whole roast is done. It isn't. It's heated through. It's not roasted. And all these things are awful because they are the result of the illusion of time. That there is something that is good for us and that we're going to get to. And so uh, this is the result of an educational system which is completely geared to literary and mathematical pursuits which trains everybody to be clerks, sales, uh, insurance salesmen and bureaucrats. And only with great reluctance does education offer any kind of instruction in material competence, and then only for people who are considered too stupid uh, to be intellectuals, to go on to college. So the basic arts of life in our culture, farming, cooking, dressing, furnishing, lovemaking, are utterly neglected. There is no sophisticated training widely available in any of these things for the average person. And so that, that's the reason why there is nothing on which to spend the time that we save and the money we earn, except trash. 
So uh, fake cars, pasteboard houses, bread made of squishy styrofoam, vitamin enriched, and uh, all that sort of thing, see, because of the illusion, uh, we've fallen for the illusion of time. So only uh, uh, the, 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 what is absolutely necessary for a culture, that means a society of cultivated people, is the cultivation and devotion to the present, to the material world, rather than to the purely theoretical world. You see, maya in Sanskrit uh, does indicate in one sense the physical world, because uh, in the positive sense that the physical world is actually a marvelous work of art. But maya, in another sense, in the sense in which it means measurement, refers to all the ways we have of numbering and naming and dividing up into categories the physical world. So time is maya. Latitude and longitude is maya. The future is maya. In the, the, the less... Uh, exciting sense of illusion. So, you see, because of this state of mind, we, we don't uh, think that play is important. We play in order to refresh ourselves to go back to work. And that's not playing. Playing is uh, a real absorption in, a, in the delight of a dance, for example. You don't dance because it's good for you. You dance because you're happy. But you see, we have a very odd incapacity for happiness because we are happier when we expect good things to happen rather than when they're happening. And so we say of a thing that we consider bad, <coughs> it has no future. Well, nothing has a future. There isn't a future. There's always a present, and one has to get this as a kind of a basic approach. So then, one can also, therefore, use the word play or game in a sense that is not trivial. We don't think, for example, that when we hear a performance of a Bach cantata, or better, a purely uh, non-symbolic thing, like a fugue, uh, we don't think that that's trivial. We don't think it's trivial to play the organ in church. Uh, we don't think that the plays of Shakespeare are trivial. They're plays. A play, you see, in the sense that I'm using it, is a musical thing. It is a dance. It is an expression of delight in the sense of Blake saying that energy is eternal delight. And, uh, for example, the art of Islam, the arabesques, which aren't pictures of anything. They're just fantastically intricate, beautifully colorful designs. They are play. And according to this thesis, the universe is just like that. It is a very, very elaborate play system. And the fundamental elements of this play the Chinese call the yang and the yin. Yang means uh, the positive and yin the negative. Yang refers to the south side of a mountain, which is in the sun, and yin to the north side, which is in the shade. Yang refers to the north bank of a river, which is in the sun, and yin to the south bank of a river, which is in the shade. Yang is symbolically or prototypically male, Yin is symbolically female. That's not to cast any reflections on women. Uh, but uh, so you might say this, the reason they're called male and female is that yang is aggressive and yin is yielding. Uh, yang is convex, yin is concave. Now, the secret about the opposites which is as important as realizing that there is no such thing as time. The secret about the opposites is this, that they appear to be as different as different can be. We say of opposites, like black and white, 
that the, they are the poles apart. But in using that phrase, poles, you imply a connection between them. As there is a connection of the north to the south pole of the earth, and as there is a connection between the north and south poles of a magnet. They are two ends of the same stick, two sides of the same coin, two opposite points on the same sphere. And that means that they go together. In Chinese, this is called arising mutually, as in the second chapter of Lao Tzu, where he says, when all the world knows beauty to be beautiful, there is already ugliness. When all the world knows goodness to be good, there is already evil. For to be and not to be arise mutually. What confuses people is that they don't see this. They think, for example, that the positive is something there which truly exists whereas the negative has less reality. It doesn't exist. We think that, for example, the space in which this universe floats is a non-entity and has no importance. And we are thereby, because we see energy manifested in the positive aspect of things, and no energy manifested in the negative, we are afraid that energy and its delight is threatened by nothingness. That it's going to be swallowed up and that in the end darkness will win. We feel that about ourselves and we feel it about the universe as a whole. Because energy is effort. And effort, after a while, you get tired and you can't keep it up. And so darkness must win. <clears throat> according to Chinese philosophy that is a hallucination because energy cannot be manifested without inertia there must be something to push against for there to be any manifestation of energy you cannot dance without a floor to use your energy against you cannot, when energy or any kind of motion is completely unobstructed, there's a sort of squish, a fizzle, and nothing happens. Because fundamentally, as we shall see next hour, motion is only realized when there is stillness, relative stillness. And so energy is only realized when there is inertia and the positive is only realized when there is the negative to bring it out. These things work together, but when you don't realize it, you are anxious. You are afraid that the dark side is going to win. Now, the minute that happens, you become unable to play. You start getting serious and the game degenerates into a fight. Because you feel it absolutely urgent and necessary under those circumstances that the positive must be made to win. Accentuate the positive, you see. And that leads to all this beastly kind of religion where people go around with four smiles and hearty handshakes and uh, uh, accentuate the positive. And the moment a person does that, you know that it's a big fake, it's a put-on, and that there's something utterly unreal about it. That's why you may have often experienced the fact that certain kinds of virtuous people are offensively virtuous, <laughs> and they are very difficult to get on with. They don't have any light touch. <coughs> and, of course, this is particularly prevalent in religions. Because... Uh, not all religions, but many religions are states of terror about the negative side. 
I was talking with a very enlightened nun the other day, Catholic, and she was open to all sorts of new ideas. I said, you know, uh, there's one thing wrong with your worship and the way you sing your hymns and chant your chants and uh, do all these rituals. You don't swing. That means, I don't mean by that that it isn't syncopated. I mean by that that there is not an attitude of delight about it. It's always you feel the service is being conducted in the presence of the chief inspector of morals. The, uh, the, the original stuffed shirt. The appalling grandfather in whose presence you don't uh, show any kind of sprightliness because after all, you know, when we are children and we are very exuberant and we leap around and bounce and all over the place, we make the adults tired. Because the moment a child starts getting exuberant, is that we try to give him a guilty conscience. You have no business having so much fun. There are other people in the world who hurt. There are people who are starving. There are people who suffer. And for you to go around leaping around as if the whole thing were gorgeous is a kind of irreverence. So be guilty. Shut up. So as a result of that, where we think that an occasion is of particular solemnity, where you're in church or in court or uh, standing in a row of uh, marines or something saluting the flag, uh, everybody gets grim. And so there is no delight in religion of that kind. Well, this nun agreed with me that uh, they, they really ought to do something about that. And I said, well, maybe I'll come to your convent and teach you how to sing. <laughs> <coughs> But you see, all of that is because uh, of the fear that the nothing will win over the something. Now, it's true in games, there is a winner and there is a loser. But in a fight, it's different. In a fight, the object of victory is to get rid of the defeated party because he's bad and he ought not to be there at all. But in a game it's quite different because if there is to be a winner there has to be a loser. So it's terribly important not to get rid of the opponent. You could have no chess unless you had the black side as well as the white. Impossible. So in a game, uh, what we, we admire, a person we call a good loser. That is to say, a good sport. Because he does not take the loss seriously. It's very instructive, for example, to play any game that you know well, whether it's chess or checkers or whatever, with yourself. And each time you move over to the opposite side, uh, play it with your best skill. For example, you can play a very marvelous game. You take two cocktail um, olive uh, toothpicks, you know, the kind they, they make into little plastic swords, and you do a fencing match with yourself and actually try to stick one of your hands and the other hand really tries to defend itself. You find this is extremely interesting. It's a meditation exercise. And, uh, and then you realize, you see, uh, what is the nature of a game. Because if you are a good chess player, uh, you may congratulate yourself if your opponent wins if you have given him a good contest. Because then the game as such was interesting. And you come to realize that you and your opponent in a game of chess together constitute a single organism, like your right hand and your left hand fencing with each other. 
Let not your left hand know what your right hand doeth. That means have a conspiracy to pretend that they don't belong to one organism and that they're different, like black and white, like space and solid. They must look as different as possible. But underneath, in order that there be a game, in order that there be, in other words, a relationship of these two, there has to be a secret agreement. They have to be tacitly one, but uh, openly two. Exoterically two, esoterically one. Because, you see, on the stage when you get the hero and the villain, they are really friends behind the scenes because they belong to the same company of actors. But this mustn't be admitted on the stage because that would give the show away. Now you see, it's true, we mustn't give the show away. That's why there are esoteric teachings. But on the other hand, there is another opposite extreme uh, which is not realizing that the show is a show. And that's as bad as giving the show away. So you have always, when you are in the theater, say you go to the movies, and you go to see some <clears throat> great horror movie, you know, awful thing. Well, why does one do it? You want a thrill. And the whole of the universe wants a thrill. That's what it's all about. Otherwise it would be boring. But when you go to the movie, you know in your heart of hearts that it's only a movie. And yet you contrive to some degree to forget this while you're there. And therefore get scared and uh, feel real creeps. But that's great. Some people like to go and cry. They go and see some tragedy and just love to weep because it's a catharsis. It uh, gets all the salt out of you or something. I don't know. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, so uh, you, 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 you do this thing. And uh, it is, we can say it's vicarious. Yep. But that is the spirit of showmanship, of play. So one might say then that uh, it is possible in this life to attain a sort of metaphysical courage in which you are, you know, really know deep within that the most harrowing experiences that physical existence can offer are a show. Now this is the, uh, what you might call, ultimate nerve. And, for example, when the samurai in Japan studied Zen, that's what they wanted to get from it. They wanted to get ultimate nerve so that absolutely nothing would faze them. So there is a poem which says, under the sword lifted high, there is hell making you tremble. But go ahead, and there is the land of bliss. Don't hesitate, see? Don't, don't be blocked. Don't be um, phased, nonplussed by the illusion. Now you would say, well, that's all very well, but I can't bring myself to that. I start to shake and I can't stop it. It's not to do with my will. And no amount of gritting my teeth, clenching my muscles, uh, exercising my willpower can get rid of the shakes when I am really scared. That's true. But you must remember that the secret to all this is not to be afraid of fear. When you can really allow yourself to be afraid and you don't resist the experience of fear, you are truly beginning to master fear. But when you refuse to be afraid, you are resisting fear. And that simply sets up a vicious circle of being afraid of fear and being afraid of being afraid of fear and so on. And that's what we call worry. Worry is simply a chronic 
condition. And people who worry are going to worry no matter what happens. Because when one possible threat is exterminated, they will immediately discover another. Because worry is an infinitely skinned onion. And you can go on and on and on because the moment you see you reduce the size of the onion and you get your worry down to about this, suddenly your whole sense of distance and size changes. And because you're looking so intently at this little onion, it fills your whole field of vision and is once again a big onion. See? And you start peeling that down. But as you get another little one about this size, then it enlarges itself in your judgment and your sense of values. And it, once more it's colossal. Now that's always going on. So if you are disposed to worry, there is always plenty to worry about. You make plenty of money and you have no troubles about that, then you start wondering if you're going to get a disease. And the doctor says, no, it's all right, you, you, nothing wrong with you. Then you wonder if you're going to get into an accident. And then you take precautions and then you wonder if there's going to be a political revolution, um, etc whether your house is going to be robbed. Uh, there's always something. So it is a, really, this kind of worrying is a completely useless pursuit. And yet, we feel a little guilty if we don't do it. Because uh, it's somehow put into us that a proper amount of worrying is uh, showing a good sense of responsibility. You're concerned. And Paul Tillich, uh, use this word concern in a special way. And Quakers always use the word concern. And all people, you might say, who are socially conscious are concerned. So when we say, I'm concerned, it means I have a frown on my face. And uh, I, I'm, I'm worried about you, about the nation, about the war, and so on. Concerned. And Tillich said... Religion is ultimate concern. I am concerned about the universe. And he used this wonderful decontaminated word for, for God, which he got from Eckhart, the ground of being. See, God still has whiskers on it, but the ground of being doesn't, obviously. And so uh, ultimate concern is to be concerned about the ground of being. Well, now, I don't think... You, you, well, I'm not sure about Tillich. I, I knew him, and he was a very wonderful man. But w what I call concern, in the, the way I would want to interpret it, instead of this sort of frown, is something more like amazement. In other words, that existence... <coughs> is extremely peculiar. Um, I mean, it's... I can't get my... I can't explain this feeling because I don't know quite how to ask a question about existence so that I could be said to be wondering about it in some sort of clear-thinking way. What... what uh, it's a very nice thing to consider to yourself that if you were going to have an interview with the Lord God and you would have only five minutes, and you might ask one question, what would you ask? And you've got plenty of time to think this over in advance. <laughs> and you realize, question after question, you say, no, that's not really the thing I want to get at. Uh-uh, it's not that. Like, do you exist? <laughs> God would say, well, of course, <laughs> yes, here I am. <laughs> Am I having a hallucination? <laughs> no. Well, uh, I'm, how can I be sure that this isn't a hallucination, you see? And then you reject all that sort of question. And when you finally come down to it, you don't know what to ask. There is a sort of question in your mind, not so much a question as a questioning, a feeling of it's all unbelievable. It's amazing. I wonder at it. I marvel at it. It is a miracle that there is anything. But um, 
It's like a friend of mine who went to a Zen master, got an interview after a good deal of trouble, an interpreter. And he sat down and said, you know, now I'm here, I don't know what to ask. I just feel like laughing. And Zen master said, well, let's laugh. <laughs> and they just broke up. So... <laughs> But that feeling, you see, of the, the marvelousness of being is what I call, or would want to mean by Tillich's phrase, ultimate concern. It's also love is involved in it. See, that's the part of the problem of um, an abstractionist culture such as ours. As I indicated, we are not materialists, we are abstractionists. Uh, a materialist is a, is a lover, and therefore is somebody related to the present. Because, you see, you, you can't love except in the present. When you have under your hands a piece of wood, and uh, you say, my, hasn't that a gorgeous grain, you know, and you fondle it. If it moves, fondle it. <laughs> and uh, you, you, you run over this and think, hey, it's not gorgeous, you see. Well, you're, so you're loving it. Uh, it may be that it's an apple in your hand, and you say, I love you so much I could eat you. And you eat it. And you relish it. That's loving in a special way. So uh, concern and love, and there are many forms of love, there's a whole spectrum of different kinds of love which runs from the red of libido to the violet of divine charity. But all of them are equally important because, as you know, you can't have the violet end without the red end, and vice versa. You wouldn't know what violet was unless you had all the other colors. The colors create each other. So it isn't simply black and white. Between black and white is the spectrum. And just as black and white arise mutually, so you know red in relation to yellow, in relation to green, in relation to blue, and so on. But they all come out of black and white. That's the secret. I think Mr. Land, who invented a camera, made a rather spectacular demonstration of this. So, if then you try to obliterate fear, the fear that black may win. You're working in the wrong way. To attack a fear is to strengthen it. Because immediately you feel guilty if you don't succeed. Or you feel inadequate. But fear is something that arises naturally and spontaneously under certain circumstances just as you will feel warm if you get near a fire. And uh, you can't go up to a fire without some sort of self-hypnosis and then say, well, I refuse to be warm. There's something a bit weird about that. Besides, you often want to feel warm when you get near a fire. No, on the contrary, it is very natural to be afraid. And so if you don't try to knock it down, you don't try to make yourself over into some sort of preconceived idea of what you ought to be, then you're on the track. Now, when you think, for example, that I ought to change myself into something different, but what is the agency which will affect this change? Well, we could say two things. 
on the one hand, it's the same self that you want to change. So how can it change it? Or on the other hand, you can say that the idea that there is a sort of separate ego in you which can go to work on the rest of you is a hallucination. And that's why gurus and teachers set their students weird tasks they may discover that the dissociated ego is indeed a hallucination. Now, for example, one of the ones that is commonly used is to get yourself a pure mind. And that means you control your thoughts and emotions. You mustn't have any violent or hateful emotions. You mustn't hate anybody. You mustn't have any sexy emotions. All pure ideas. Clean up. You know what happens. It's, uh, so many... Uh, in the parent-child relationship, uh, many parents can't stand their children. Uh, they're a nuisance. They're the result of bad rubber goods. And uh, they didn't mean to have them anyway. And they're expensive and noisy. And they've disturbed the peace of the place... And they, they detest them. But you cannot admit in this culture that you detest your child. That's the most awful thing. But you see, what happens if you don't admit it is that whereas outwardly you go through the motions of being loving and dutiful, you don't smell right, and the child gets it. The child knows intuitively and inwardly that there's a crossed-up message here. It says love, but it acts hate. Vice versa. A lot of children hate their mothers, hate their fathers. That's supposed to be very bad. And the, the whole pandemonium that's going on these days is uh, largely due to that, that nobody can come out and be honest about it. So now control your thoughts. Watch that hate. The moment it arises, doing. <laughs> Knock it down. Well, now you know the guru who's teaching you all this. Uh, you've projected quite a bit on him. Uh, the fact that you've accepted a guru at all shows that um, you have endowed another person with much greater wisdom than yourself. That's your opinion, incidentally. <laughs> and therefore, people invariably attribute to gurus are all kinds of astounding powers, especially of a telepathic nature. And indeed... Uh, a good guru is a very sensitive fellow and can tell by people's eyes and gestures and tone of voice all sorts of things about them, as can any experienced psychologist. But you see, when you are trying to control your thoughts and you know you have some kind of wrong thought, you project upon the guru to recognize it instantly. He reads you. He sees right through you. And therefore you know that he almost must look at you as a terrible worm. Because you can never quite succeed in doing it, you see. And the lesson of this is, you see, the whole point of this lesson, is to discover that the alleged you, which is different from your thoughts and feelings, is a hallucination. There is a stream of thought and feeling going on, just like there is a stream of water going by, and that's you. It's an organized stream, just in the same way that when you see a whirlpool in a river, it's organized, it's recognizable, it has a shape, and it has an enduring shape, even though it is a constant flow. Or take a better illustration, still a, a flame on a candle. It is a stream of gas. 
and no particle of this gas stays in the flame for but a split second. But the flame keeps apparently there and is recognizable. I can say one, two, three flames, this one, that one, the other one. And that's like us. But that stream, which we are, is thought, feeling, uh, what we call the body, uh, everything like that. But the body is one of the most intangible things there is. You seem to be able to grab hold of it. But it is nothing more than a vibrating pattern of energy. And on it flows. So when you understand that, uh, you can see a little bit more why Hindus speak of the body as maya, as illusion. Because one of the things they mean by illusion is transitoriness as distinct from permanence. That is to say, everything in this world is <coughs> disintegrating. <coughs> in fact, if it weren't, it wouldn't be there. Disintegration is life. And it's as important to see that as it is to see that there is no time and that black and white go together. Because it, to the extent that you see it is disintegrating and that there's no way of stopping this, you can get into a frame of mind where you get with it. Where you, as it were, give up and fall apart along with everything else. <laughs> <laughs> Now, you might think, you see, again, our, in our general Western frame of mind, we would think, well, that's just giving up. Yeah. That's spineless. That's cowardice. That's, uh, that's awful. And anybody who would just give up like that would be expected to become a slob. <coughs> but the contrary is true. You see, in all what you might call the dynamics of the spiritual life, there are what appear to be many paradoxes. Courses of action which in common sense would lead to one result turn out, in fact, to lead to an opposite result. So you would think that a child who admits to hatred of parents or vice versa would act out the hatred, would do something violent. No, it is precisely the one who does not admit it that will act out and who will do something violent. Because like the monk of Siberia, who are fasting grew wearier and wearier, the violence will at last burst from itself. It can't be contained. And I found again and again and again, going around, especially in religious circles, where so many people are trying to n not admit what they feel. Especially Puritans, prudes very frequently have a strong streak of cruelty and this of course can be a kind of a sexual substitute a sadistic uh, or masochistic thing uh, that is simply because they, they don't ad admit to having a negative side and so the negative side will express itself in a violent way uh, people who are always doing things for other people's good uh, will be liable to, to bomb them for their benefit uh, and utterly destroy them in the name of goodness. And uh, this is because uh, such people are not ever going to be good soldiers. I was uh, talking a few, day, uh, a few weeks ago to the Air Force Weapons Research Lab at Kirtland, uh, near Albuquerque. And uh, I was somewhat surprised to be invited to this sinister institution. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it was full of extremely brilliant people. Uh, <laughs> fantastic minds. And so naturally, we got onto the subject of strategy. 
because uh, military strategy is a very, very interesting thing. It contains all the basic life problems. And I said to them when I started out, I said, now, you have asked me to tell you as a philosopher what are my basic premises for moral behavior? Well, I said they are total selfishness. I'm not going to beat around the bush with you people. I'm going to be sentimental or anything like that because uh, you're dealing with uh, military matters mm -hmm. uh, where you have to be tough and where you have to uh, be so tough that you've no time for finer feelings. So let's begin that way. Now, I said, you might imagine, therefore, that if I based my behavior on total selfishness, that I would go around being rude to people and aggressive and uh, pushing through and so on. But I said, I don't because I found it doesn't work. People put up resistance, they get uh, obstreperous, and I don't win them over. So my self-interest is better conserved by putting on a pretense of politeness and that I really am concerned about you all and so on, but I said I am not. Uh, this is just a big act. Now then I said the next thing that happens is this. When I decide that I'm going to base everything on total selfishness, I start wondering what I want. Well, so many things that I thought I want, when I got them, I found out I didn't. So I have to go very deeply into the question, what do I really want? What sort of friends do I want? What sort of a house do I want? What sort of a life do I want? What sort of a job do I want to do? And you see, people don't think this through. They get all sorts of ready-made ideas of what they ought to want. Because what education does to us so, to so large an extent is to fit us into a set of prepared stereotypes. And we never stop to find out what we really want to do. Well, that's one thing. But then something else very odd comes up when I say I'm purely selfish, which is, what is me? And then I come across this curious thing that I don't know who I am unless I know who you are. If I would live without any other people, I don't think I would know I was there. I see myself in terms of others. That is to say, by a social relationship. I am I because you are you. You are you because I am I. But then, uh, something, something that's gone screwy here, something funny about this, which is, of course, that myself isn't at all what I thought it was. Myself is... almost everything else as well as myself. Well, then I really don't know what to do because um, there's no point in my thinking anymore that I can just go around attacking people and uh, getting rid of them and so on. And uh, 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 Because all I'm doing is a sort of um, as if I was hungry and I started chewing on my own toes. because I have discovered that hurting others hurts me. Now, of course, you do have to cut your toenails and take care of your hair and things like that. And uh, there's always uh, some kind of violence is necessary in life, just like you have to kill a fish to eat it, or you have to kill an apple when you chew it. Well, it's sort of like cutting off the toenails and combing your hair and so on, and clipping and things like that. And sort of like getting rid of dead skin and the general elimination process. But fundamentally, you see, when you think that there are dreadfully wrong people who ought to be obliterated or that the world outside you is something that you are in a fight with, well, that's just like um, a person who uh, <coughs> is completely insensitive in the middle so that he doesn't know that his legs, leg end, goes with the top end. Um, you know that in worms, uh, if a worm gets damaged, it develops a sort of calloused area in it. 
and uh, the, the worm, when it wiggles, the rhythm of the wiggle doesn't pass through the calloused area. It has to wiggle separately on each end. So the worm, instead of going wiggle, 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 goes wiggle, bump, wiggle, bump, wiggle, bump, wiggle. <laughs> and uh, so uh, uh, a lot of people are like that physically. Now, this is one of the important things that Wilhelm Reich found out, that uh, people tend to have a state of tension in the diaphragm as a result of which they can't swing. Uh, you know, uh, have you ever tried to teach anybody to dance the hula? Lots of people just cannot bring themselves to make that hip motion. They're too rigid. And they're like the worm with the callus in them. Or then there's another myth about this. You know, there's a famous snake called Ouroboros. And he's always drawn chewing his own tail and eating it. Imagine what happens when the tail gets inside and it gets inside and inside and the whole thing is clutched up, you see? Uh, and this worm, is a, this snake, is a symbol of what the Buddhists call samsara, that is to say the round or rat race of life and death. And this goes on so long as the worm doesn't know that his tail is himself. When he discovers that, uh, he lets go of it and wiggles happily along uh, uh, like a, every good snake should. <laughs> uh, of course, there is something more to it than that. You might say, well, why in the first place did he not realize that his tail was his own? Well, because he wanted something else. See, there wasn't anything except the snake in the beginning, because the snake is the symbol of God. But uh, in the Upanishads, in the Isha Upanishad, the first line of it said that in the beginning there was the one uh, God, the Ishvara. And he said, I'm lonely. And so he made another, which was a woman. And he made love to her. As a result of which all gods were born. But the woman got guilty about this because she felt it was incest. And so she turned herself into a cow. And he became a bull. And he made love to her. And so came all cattle. And the same thing happened. She got guilty and turned herself into a sheep. And he turned himself into a ram. And so on. And by this means the universe was created. So uh, this is othering. It's called in Christian theology by the Greek word kenosis, which means self-emptying. Uh, where God others himself in the sense of getting himself into a position where he forgets he's God. Or where he has abrogated omnipotence. Now, in the theory of games, it is absolutely important to abrogate omnipotence. Because you realize that if you knew, if your knowledge and power was without limit, there were no obstacle to it whatsoever, there would be no way of realizing it. When we know for certain the outcome of a game, we don't play it. We call it off. And we invent a new game in which we don't know the outcome. So power, whether partial power or omnipower, will always be in a state of abrogating itself. So the fundamental game, therefore, the fundamental game form, which is manifested in the yang and the yin, the two opposites, is, of course, the game of hide-and-seek. Of remembering and forgetting. You see, uh, really, to forget is the opposite of remember. Only the word hasn't the same form. We should put remember opposite dismember. Because... To remember is to put back the members of something that has been dismembered. So when the snake thinks that its tail isn't itself, it is dismembered. When the snake finds that its tail is itself, it's remembered. So that's why uh, the Catholics say uh, the words of Jesus at the Mass, do this in remembrance of me. 
so that you will discover that you are one body, which is, of course, the only body there is.